Good evening or good morning, wherever you are, uh, to this seminar. I'm Karl Kaiser. I'm an associate of the project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship at the Harvard Kennedy School and an associate of the Center for European Studies. And our two institutions organized this seminar jointly. This session will be recorded and we assume that you give your consent that it will be recorded. I also welcome on this occasion the members of the American Council on Germany, its Warburg chapter, the uh, World Boston members, and the American German Council here in, uh, in New England. There are about 240 people who have registered from all over the world, uh, primarily Europe and uh, America, but nevertheless from everywhere. I cannot welcome all of them, but I would welcome one, that is Pierre Keller, who is the founder of our program, who lives in his isolation in the mountains of Switzerland. The, the, the and Vasil, two panelists for today's session on Germany's and France's reaction to the COVID crisis. Daniela Schwarzer and Thierry de Montbrial, both old friends for many years. And let me start with Daniela. Both are distinguished people with a very long career and lots to say. So let me just say that Daniela is the director of the German Council on Foreign Relations, a post which I once held. She has worked and published on European Union affairs, on transatlantic matters. She has worked in several countries and held posts there, Germany, France, the United States, and she has taught in various countries. She has advised the Polish and the, Ger and the French government. Thierry de Montbréal um, from France, uh, he is the founder of many institutions, the planning staff of the Foreign Ministry of France, of the French Institute of International Relations, of the World Policy Conference, he has written numerous books on international affairs. He has uh, taught in various countries and still does. He is a member of the Institut de France. We are very pleased that both of you could join us to tell us more about how France and Germany react to the present crisis. America, Europe, the whole world has been profoundly affected. It has deeply changed our lives. This crisis will change domestic politics and international politics, and we're just at the beginning of it. And so let us re review how two major countries uh, are dealing with it. Of course, here in America, we very much also look at Europe and at the reaction of the major countries and uh, look in particular at their best practices, what works, what doesn't work. So let me start with Daniela. Um, uh, how does Germany react, uh, particularly also in the view of the fact that the Council of the European Union yesterday made a number of decisions which profoundly affect uh, the further development of the reaction of the various countries of the European Union. Daniela. Thank you very much, Carl, for your kind introduction and for putting the seminar together with colleagues in, in these challenging times. It's great to have a a European and transatlantic discussion all in one this, this afternoon or evening here in Germany. Um, you asked us for very brief introductions of five to six minutes, so I'll, throw, I'll try and make three points. Two concern Germany's approach to the crisis, and I will focus both on the health, but also on the economic crisis, and then I will turn to the European dimension. Now, with regards to the health crisis, I must say that in European, but also in transatlantic comparison, Germany is faring quite well, uh, mostly because of, first of all, a chance to observe what had been happening in other fellow EU member states. Italy and, and France were slightly ahead of the curve. And I think this, uh, yeah, this observation that the German government could make with regards to the rapid development of the pandemic and the huge challenge that this posed to the health systems and very obviously in, in, in countries which have solid health systems as well, 
uh, that led to to a lot of prudence in Germany. However, the uh, the the way towards the lockdown measures and uh, the stepping up of, of medical provisions wasn't uh, flawless and was in some ways uh, from the outside it seemed sometimes uncoordinated, which is partly due to our federalist system, where of course uh, the federal government can say certain certain things, but then on the lender level in the regions. Uh, decisions may be taken more quickly or more slowly. Um, and right now, we are in the middle of a situation where the Chancellor is trying to, to calm down this push for a loosening of the lockdown. Um, in terms of infected uh, people and deaths, as I said, we are in a rather, I don't want to say comfortable situation because it's never comfortable, but in a less dramatic situation than fellow countries, which has mounted the pressure on policymakers to loosen the lockdown measures. Also, because obviously, like in other EU countries, our economy is suffering uh, a lot. And so the business sector is mounting pressure, in particular, also restaurants and hotels and so on. Now, with regards to the economic uh, crisis, uh, the federal government acted very swiftly comparing it to the economic downturn uh, a good 10 years ago, much more quickly and more robustly. Because of course, Germany could learn from those crisis years where some fiscal stimulus was needed, but also because the dimension of the current economic crisis is far bigger than what spelled into Germany uh, with the financial crisis in the years 2008 and, and following. Um, Germany is in the very lucky position to have quite a lot of fiscal space to be able to uh, mount programs to support business, to support uh, through the Kurzarbeit uh, program, meaning uh, it supports uh, labor. Uh, there are certain ways to support families. There is a lot out there. And just yesterday, another additional program was agreed by the federal government. Now I would like to turn to the European dimension and there Germany was pretty much criticized in the early weeks of managing the crisis for several reasons. One was that in rhetorically, uh, in uh, all the big uh, press conferences that government members, including the chancellor gave, Europe hardly played a role in the beginning. And uh, the catastrophic situation that was evolving first in Italy, but then also in France, in my personal view also wasn't mentioned enough early on. Um, then there were measures taken uh, in a purely national logic which added to the sentiment that suddenly all EU member states, including Germany, which is a declared pro-European government basically, um, turned inwards and took measures like export, imposing export controls on medical material. Uh, pulling up borders, for instance, between the Saarland and uh, the Alsace region. And so um, suddenly we saw that European borders were there again and national measures were taken even before a European discussion was engaged. But over the past weeks, we have seen a considerable rollback of these measures. First of all, with regards to medical procurement and the provision of, of breathing machines, but also masks, etc., the European Commission, with the support of the member states, launched several initiatives um, for procurement, but then also European producers basically switched to producing this kind of material. And now uh, there is a stock holding program basically by the European Commission, so to prepare for a second wave of the virus possibly. Um, the EU put up its own export uh, regime. Uh, it doesn't mean it is impossible to export medical material from the EU to third countries, but uh, there are certain rules that have to be respected. And there are, of course, particular rules regarding close partners, um, such as the EFTA countries. And the discussion right now is whether there should be special rules for the Eastern partnership countries as well. So we can see that the, the health emergency and the immediate protectionist me measures that were driven by health logics are now um, reviewed from a geopolitical perspective, of course. Um, Carl, you asked me to briefly comment on last night's uh, European Council meeting. It was an important meeting um, for several reasons. One is it was uh, one of several emergency meetings that the European Council held via video conference. 
compared to the uh, previous crisis that Europe went through, for instance, in the years 2010-11, we can observe that this happened far more rapidly than in previous years. So this European response on the top level came quickly, but there was a lot of controversy, uh, in particular during the first um, and second meeting. Now, what was this about? It was essentially around the question, how can an a, a economic support program be funded and what kind of aid uh, do e the European partners need to set up to support those countries that are particularly hit? And here we could see a, a re-emergence of all the traditional reflexes that we know all too well in the Eurozone with regards to risk sharing, burden sharing, the costs of uh, economic uh, relaunch programs. And uh, what we saw was clearly a standoff between a group of Southern European countries led by France uh, and Northern um, and, and to some extent Central and Eastern European countries in the beginning. But then the front line softened. Um, I'm very glad to say that this happened rather quickly given the generally very tense situation. And last night's uh, European summit was able to endorse a program, an economic relaunch program, which has several pillars. One of them, and this happened very early, is of course uh, the role of the European Central Bank, which has, you know, it has political backing from all EU governments, which is of course also out of self-interest, uh, out of self-interest because what the ECB does, uh, the governments to some extent don't need to do. But as the crisis in 2010 and following years already showed, it won't happen only through the Central Bank that the econ economy and financial markets can be stabilized. So. Now, what, what was decided yesterday are several additional pillars. One is a big program for the European Investment Bank. Then there is a program called SURE, which is basically a, uh, a program to export Germany's Kurzarbeit um, uh, system, meaning a support to employees in a situation where, where companies can't pay the workers anymore to prevent layoffs and bridge, at least for some time, uh, a dire situation, not only economically, but also socially. And the fourth big pillar is now up for debate. There is a declared need to set up something like a big economic recovery fund, um, but so far leaders weren't able to agree on uh, how this should be funded, what the money should be spent for, and what the volume of this fund should be. Now, one important thing to say is that the German position has evolved over time. Our finance minister this morning gave an important interview in which he said several things which are remarkable. One of them is that uh, this program, first of all, should be, can't only be funded by national contributions, but there needs to be a mix. One can be that the own resources of the European Union which are there to fund the EU budget uh, shall be expanded, meaning the EU budget will considerably grow and the income sources will be tapped into uh, more strongly. And there needs to be something like a jointly European bond, a jointly guaranteed European bond. It doesn't mean debt mutualization of national governments, but it means that leaders recognize that it is important to go to the financial markets together. Um, and the other thing that was remarkable in his interview was that he said, this is not only about loans, uh, but we may basically we have to make grants, meaning transfers. So the recognition, and that is also something Commission President von der Leyen said, is there, that uh, there has to be something like a real support program similar to the Marshall Plan, uh, which we all know was part of Europe's recovery story in the post-war years. So let me close on, on three principles that I think uh, the economic recovery program must respect. First of all, it has to be designed in a way that it doesn't enhance divergence, which is there anyway within the EU. That is key and that will make it difficult for those countries that are well off because they realize they have to pay more, but out of their own self-interest. Second principle, it needs to be designed in such a way if we do put one trillion uh, euros out there that the transitions that the European economy goes through are actually supported, meaning digitization, 
uh, greening of the economy, um, but also surviving with its competitiveness in an increasingly hostile world, as we know. Mm -hmm. and, the third, and the third principle is that I think any big funding program that the EU sets up needs to make sure that the member states that benefit from this money respect the fundamental principles of the EU, which are the rule of law and democracy, which is not an evidence today in all EU member states. Thank you very much. Fair. Thank you very much, Daniela, for, for, for your remarks, in particular the analysis of the new de decisions. Thierry, um, we remember that Macron was very critical also of Germany. Do you think that we are now on the right track? And how does France react domestically? Well, uh, I'd like to take the issue uh, uh, in a different order, if you, if you allow me. Well, first, unfortunately, I have to recognize that in terms of efficiency of the response to the crisis, uh, Germany has done much, much better than France. Uh, of course, you know, we had this uh, 10 days uh, delay. Uh, the uh, crisis uh, came, uh, the virus came in Germany about 10 days uh, after France, but it is not the only uh, reason. In fact, uh, yesterday, as of yesterday, in Germany, you had a little more than 5,000 dead. In France, we had more than 21,000. That is more than uh, roughly four times. And uh, I think the reason for that, the basic, from, from the health uh, care situation, the uh, basic reason for that is uh, the, uh, has to be looked in the direction of the efficiency of uh, uh, the, the healthcare systems in both countries, because we roughly spend the same amount of money, or the same amount of money per capita at least. Uh, and uh, you had three or four times as many beds as we had. You had uh, no problem with masks, with tests, you know, you could massively test from the beginning. You had uh, enough respirators, and so forth and so on. So uh, the fundamental uh, problem in the case of France, is always the same that we have everywhere. That is, we have not an efficient uh, public sector, and in particular in this uh, area. So uh, after the crisis, it's very clear that this will have to be reviewed in a very, very fundamental way. Now, uh, on the economic uh, aspect also, Daniela uh, mentioned what, uh, how swiftly the, the, uh, the, the German government has responded. And uh, in, the, in the case of France today, what is the situation? Today, more than 50% of the industrial sector is just halted, stopped. No. And uh, not only the industrial uh, sector, which means that to reactivate the economic uh, engine, it will be uh, probably much more difficult than uh, in the case of, of, of Germany. And uh, here we have a, a, a very big problem because uh, we cannot allow even politically, not only economically, but politically, to have too large a gap between uh, Germany uh, and France. And not only Germany and France, because uh, the, it's Germany and the other European countries uh, uh, as well. And, and Germany, by the way, needs us too because of interdependence. You know, if, if, if it's impossible to, to reactivate the, the, uh, the, the economy in Germany uh, if, if, if the rest of us do poorly. So we, here we have a number of uh, very uh, big challenges. Now, uh, I uh, think that uh, if we have a look, if you take a political look at home in France, I would say that here too, the situation is uh, slightly different from that in, in Germany. In Germany, uh, Angela Merkel is very popular <laughs> uh, again. And uh, I think this has changed the overall domestic political situation in, in Germany, uh, probably not uh, uh, no time to discuss that tonight. Uh, in France, I would say that uh, Macron and uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, uh, are uh, I mean, respected. I mean, there is no fundamental polemics at this stage between the uh, uh, 
majority, if we can speak of a majority, and the oppositions, oppositions with an S, because I don't know exactly what is the opposition in, in France today. Uh, but uh, does it mean that when uh, the situation of the after uh, virus uh, can or is perceived to be uh, with us, does it mean that it will be easy for uh, Macron? I doubt it very much because I think that uh, the most likely uh, situation is that uh, all the trade unions, the CGP and the others, and also the yellow uh, vest or the, the yellow jackets uh, will uh, demonstrate again. This means that the social situation is going to be extraordinarily difficult, especially if the recovery, the economic recovery uh, is not uh, swift enough. So I think we're going to have some uh, very deep uh, problems. I would like to add that uh, all this is not Macron's responsibility it's, uh, because all this political domestic situation and the economic situation I'm describing, of course, comes from uh, decades uh, 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 the past. So it's going to be very, very uh, difficult. Now, now let me say uh, something from a different viewpoint on, on Europe. I will look at uh, Europe from a different angle than uh, Daniela. Uh, well, first, uh, you, are told, you, you ask me, uh, we crit did, did, we, did we, we criticize Germany? Well, a little bit as usual, and, and, and vice versa. The Germans also crit criticized us. That's more or less the usual uh, game. Also, you will have the classical differences in style. For instance, uh, 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 President Steinmeier said uh, uh, that uh, das ist kein Krieg, and uh, Macron said uh, we on est en guerre. No? So that's typical uh, uh, rhetorical uh, difference. But I will not uh, insist too much in, the, in terms of styles. In fact, what is the stake, what are the stakes for France and Germany today? It is clearly to save the European project, because if there is something we should agree on, well, the French, of course, in a very loudly style, as always, and Macron's interview in the Financial Times, for instance, on, May, on April 17, put it very clearly. So we, we, we put that in a very dramatic way, so we should save the European Union. It seems to me that the Germans share that viewpoint, but in a much more, much softer uh, way in terms of, of rhetoric, uh, at least. So, uh, but this is the issue. This is one of the issues, because there is a second one, and I think that Daniela made the point also in, uh, in her way, which is we have now to demonstrate that democracies can, are able to overcome such a crisis. And this is not sure yet. This is not sure. So if we fail in uh, either direction, that is, if we appear to be incapable of overcoming this crisis by democratic means, uh, or uh, if, uh, for instance, we allow the Eurozone to collapse, no. then it would be, it would be for sure, the, the beginning of the end of the European Union. I think we are all aware of that, and this is why we are likely to, to avoid it. And if you allow me one last, one very last point. Uh, in fact, uh, with the new European Commission, we have been relatively lucky no, it could have been much worse if we, if we remember the, the political context. Uh, and uh, this commission will have a number of good people. And uh, I think, for instance, that the uh, idea the, 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 uh, of Ursula von der Leyen uh, that uh, talking about the geopolitical commission, uh, the, this is perhaps the opportunity to make it, to, to make it a reality. I'm thinking particularly of one point, which is the relation to China. Uh, you remember, uh, Daniela, that for the 40th anniversary of the IPRI, uh, exactly a year ago, we had the chosen as the main theme, Europe facing the European Union, facing the US-Chinese rivalry. I think that you in Germany have evolved a little bit in the way you look at Germany. Not Germany, sorry, at, at China. 
And uh, I think this crisis uh, could also offer us a possibility to uh, re-equilibrate a little bit our relations with the US and, uh, and China and uh, looking uh, at a larger uh, concept of security, a security concept that would involve other issues, others than uh, the classical geopolitical issues. Thank you very much, Thierry, uh, for your remarks and particularly your last points, which enlarge the issue toward the bigger geopolitical questions. And before I start, we, we open up uh, for questions. Let me ask Daniela, do you think Germany is ready to go in the direction that Thierry just uh, suggested? Uh, as Thierry said, uh, Germany's perspective on China has changed. And this is nothing that only is a result of the COVID-19 crisis, but it happened earlier on. Um, so there is, I would say, more realism in the German perspective on uh, our own relationship with China, which is, of course, highly interdependent. Um, and there is, a, of course, a growing recognition now, uh, having lived under so many years of transatlantic relations with uh, Donald Trump as U.S. president on the other side of the Atlantic, um, that, of course, there is a sense of uncertainty uh, with regards to transatlantic relations as well. Um, and a growing recognition that Europe in this rapidly changing world needs to be strengthened and not weakened. Um, rhetorically, we are in a different place than, than France. Um, I just, you know, looked yesterday at the brief uh, press conference that Emmanuel Macron gave after the EU uh, Council meeting, and he went into the question of strategic autonomy um, and really situated what is happening in Europe in a, in a more global perspective. This is not happening to the same extent in Germany, however, I, I would say that uh, the way China is redefining the narrative of the health crisis and the way China is using uh, its provision of, of health uh, care goods uh, to EU countries, but also to Western Balkan countries, uh, that does create uh, some nervousness in Berlin because China is definitely using this crisis and it's uh, the fact that it is ahead of the curve, both health-wise, but also in terms of economic recovery very probably we'll see uh, right now the numbers aren't good for China but this you know this can change more rapidly than for Europe and this uh, hence raises a lot of uh, worries also in Berlin my last point on France Germany and China I think Emmanuel Macron made a very smart move uh, more than a year back when he invited um, the German Chancellor, along with, at the time, Jean-Claude Juncker, who was then Commission President, to a meeting with the Chinese leadership in Paris to discuss uh, questions of global governance and multilateralism. Um, and Germany, in a way, has picked up this perceived need to Europeanize relationships with China, uh, with its idea to hold a full EU 27 China summit under the German EU presidency, which is coming up in the second half of this year. We'll see whether this can happen because of the current uh, COVID-19 crisis, but the idea is there. Um, and I firmly believe that a strategic Franco-German dialogue on the relationship with China and the US is key because the primary goal needs to be to hold the EU together in this, because in a way, both the US, but also China and Russia are trying to pull the pieces apart. Um, and so the core of those two countries needs to agree on the strategy. Otherwise, we are too weak to encounter those external challenges. Okay. Thank you, Daniela. I hope that your perspective is shared by the polit politicians. We can now open the discussion. We have about half an hour. Uh, you know, most of you know the, the, the routine. You, if you want to ask for the floor, you go on the members and you raise your hand as a little symbol. Uh, <clears throat> and I will do my best uh, to, to, to let you speak. There was one person who had already asked before, so I'll start with him. That's Julian Holworth, who wanted to ask a question about borders, but 
I would like to add a question to him, uh, because since he is a, uh, an enormously important uh, uh, expert on security questions, how he sees the impact of the crisis on the security situation, both with regard to NATO and to the EU. Uh, I, I know that requires a long answer. Try and make it short, but it's a dimension we should also keep in mind. Thierry referred to it. So please go ahead, Jolien. Um, thanks very much. Am I unmuted? Yeah, you're, you're on. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Carl, for the question, which I'll respond to. Thanks very much to Thierry and to Daniela, old friends, for a very comprehensive overview of this problem. On the security thing, I, I think that this cannot but give a boost to the um, Europeanization of this uh, security nexus. But I see it not happening so much in the context of a EU only thing, which is outside of the transatlantic relationship and outside of NATO. I see it increasingly happening within a transformation of NATO process, which we are in the middle of anyway, with the rethink on NATO's future with the working party. So um, my second thought on that, however, is that security issues have disappeared from my brain in this crisis, because I think this is a much bigger existential crisis than uh, the crisis we're facing from um, international relations uh, as understood normally. The question I wanted to ask to Thierry and to Daniela is about borders, about the closure of borders. Europe prides itself on open borders. And the closing of the borders during the migrant crisis was already a body blow to Schengen. And the follow-up during COVID-19 seems to me to be an even worse threat to the, U the European Union itself. Why, if nobody can move about anyway, and the virus is already everywhere inside, is it felt so vital to make what is really a political statement about borders? And it's a misleading political statement. The borders are not really closed, they're just more tightly uh, controlled. So I wonder whether on balance, the political message behind border closure is not actually worse for the EU than any marginal increase in the spread of the virus. I wonder what you think about that. Thierry, would you like to respond? Yes. Yes, thank then you. Then perhaps Daniela briefly. But, yes, but there are many aspects actually in that question and borders, closing borders. I think it was not the European Union which started. I mean, uh, everyone in, uh, starting. Actually, I was going to the United States. I was supposed to go to the United States uh, the, 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 uh, the day before Trump decided to close the border. So uh, fortunately for me, you know, I realized that it was not wise uh, to, to, to fly. So the reality is that in spite of globalization, borders are back. So the question for the European Union is, do we want to make the European borders something serious? And if we want to, uh, if we answer yes to that question, uh, as I believe myself, then we have to tackle with the classical issues of migrations and all those uh, things we have debated for months uh, in the last few years plus uh, health and sanitary uh, questions uh, as well. Now, one point on Julian's remark that it is a much more serious uh, uh, security issue. And in fact, it takes us back to, to the basic question, what about NATO? Because I agree with Macron that NATO is dead. And NATO died actually with the collapse of the Soviet Union. We have never seen an alliance in history surviving long to the disappearance of the cause of its formation. So uh, we have to address, uh, 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 and talking about Russia, for instance, uh, Russia is the enemy we needed uh, to maintain uh, NATO alive. So if we want, if we want NATO to survive, uh, we have to review it entirely. And the issue of strategic autonomy has, of course, to be looked at in parallel or together with the question, what do we want to do uh, with NATO? And if Trump is re-elected and if we continue in the US in a Trump-like foreign policy, the, the, the question I, I am raising we, will become more and more vital. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Daniela, 
uh, there's also a question from uh, Seth Johnson, uh, which you might answer at the same time. Um, and this question is, on strategic autonomy in China, do you see a widening of the definition to include health and other human security concerns, or a doubling down on traditional security and defense? So how, how do you see the, the, the role of health now in the connection in connection with this definition of security and what is the role of the EU and the role of NATO in that in that relationship? Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll pick up Seth's question. Indeed, I guess uh, the, the scope of topics looked at under the headline of strategic autonomy is much broader now than it was before the health crisis. And um, I, I see some similarities to the debate that I, I see from afar happening uh, in the United States at the moment. And that's very much uh, triggered by the health crisis, but is essentially about the control of strategic industries here, pharmaceutical and medical devices, but it's, it's, it's a larger issue. It's older in the US because of this decoupling discussion, which has been going on for longer, but this is right now coming or spilling into Europe. And, and so the question of uh, controlling value chains, repatriating industries, taking care of crucial provisions ourselves on our own territory is new. And I think the big challenge here is not to let this segment into national debates. As I said, the first move in crisis management was essentially to, uh, to, to, to define procurement needs in the national context and not in the European context, and hence to introduce controls on national borders, not towards the outside world from a European perspective. And here we have to, we have to pay attention, but indeed the discussion is broadening pretty much. I would like to add one point uh, that is related to this one on, on the single market um, and how quickly uh, this fragmentation actually set in. I think it was striking to see that, yes, on the one hand, uh, member states or even regions put pressure on national governments to pull up borders, uh, for instance, as happened between Germany and France, which was then corrected again to, you know, to allow citizens to, to cross the border when they worked on the other side, because this was one of the big objectives also of Franco-German cooperation over the past decades to, to really uh, inter, you know, interlink societies and, and, and abolish borders uh, on a very sort of personal and day-to-day -day level. Um, but this went very quickly. And, but what struck me was that so many people actually left the European country they were living in to go home to go and live again with their parents or to be close to family. And there are two drivers. One is in a crisis, you want to be close to home, I understand that. But the other one was that European citizens who have guaranteed citizens' rights in other member states were afraid that under the given political conditions, they may not get access to health systems. And that is striking. Um, you see how fragile the so, whole idea then of European citizens' rights and access to whatever infrastructure you need is in such a situation. Mm -hmm. I would like to add one aspect on uh, the question of, of defense and security and uh, basically say that in one regard, this is very strongly on my mind because I keep drawing parallels to the situation we were facing in 2010, 11, 12, when under very tight budget constraints, defense budgets were cut and this wasn't done in a smart way at the time, purely in national logics. And the big European challenge at this point is if the fiscal constraint is as it is or as we expect it to be over the next coming years, we need to make sure that with regards to defense spending, we look at national budgets in an EU and NATO logic. So if we cut down uh, spending, we need to do it in such a way that we harm our military capabilities uh, in, the, in the smallest possible way under those conditions. Thank you very much. And uh, in view of the everlasting debate about contributions to 2%, etc., has the time not come that we redefine, redefine security to go beyond the military, to protect us also in other areas, development policy, now health policy? Um, Vivian Schmidt wanted to ask a question concerning the Franco-German relationship, since you touched upon it. Vivian, you can come in now. Uh, 
Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so I have a question about the Franco-German partnership. Um, and, and thank you both for some very illuminating um, discussion. So, uh, Daniela, um, you know, we think about Germany as the reluctant hegemon, long as the reluctant hegemon. And Thierry, we think of France as, as sort of the leader for the future. But in recent years, uh, it seems to me that Germany has remained very reluctant and France has had difficulty being a leader. In this context, sort of the current moment, um, for Thierry, uh, we see Macron trying to exercise European EU level leadership, but isn't that a bit difficult given the internal problems? It seems that he's weak internally, he lacks support. Uh, in, in terms of his response, he's only got a 4% bounce compared to even Boris Johnson getting a 20% bounce, although that probably has to do with having gotten the COVID-19, but Merkel's at 80% popularity. So for Thierry, I guess the question is, to what extent the internal lack of support may actually make it much harder for Macron and France to exercise leadership at the EU level. And so then for, Dan for Daniela, the question is um, about this deep reluctance. Um, well, you gave us good news about just the recent shift, um, but I wonder to what extent um, Germany's problem may also be its partners. I mean, we've seen a shift in public opinion at the national level in Germany in terms of more social solidarity, but massive reluctant, reluctance in particular on the part of the Dutch. So I guess to finish this question, to what extent do we still depend upon the Franco-German partnership to be the engine of EU progress? Um, or is it also about the coalition partners uh, for France at Southern Europe and sort of perhaps supporting France with a stronger voice versus Germany and its other even more reluctant partners? Thank you, Vivian. Thierry, why don't you start and then Daniela? Thank you for this extremely uh, interesting uh, questions. I think, Carl, uh, that for people like the two of us, uh, over decades we have looked at uh, the question, is there an alternative to the uh, French-German uh, uh, partnership or engine, whatever the term, uh, to uh, promote and lead the European Union? And uh, the answer, you know, whatever the approach, whatever the arguments, you always come down to the same answer. There is no alternative. So uh, if uh, the partnership works, then the European Union can move on, can progress. If it breaks down, it, is, it will be the collapse of the European Union. It's as simple as that. Now, uh, the problem is that uh, France has a vision without the means, and Germany has the means without a vision. So the question is how to match the two. And uh, Macron was elected with, he had a vision about Europe, but he had also a vision about France. And he had the, the, the vision that he could uh, undertake and conduct deep reforms. Unfortunately, this uh, process uh, was uh, softened uh, uh, and uh, slowed down with the yellow jacket uh, story and with the coronavirus, uh, it, it could be even worse. So th that's the issue. So how do we, how, how can we make compatible these, these two uh, major uh, differences. And the great risk is uh, if uh, Germany loses totally uh, the uh, idea that Europe is, is necessary. And where I am optimistic is that paradoxically, this huge, immense COVID-19 uh, virus is probably a, 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 new, a new wake up call 
for this absolute necessity of our engine, our capo, to work better. Thank you, Daniela. I, I agree with Thierry that uh, without Franco-German agreement and, and their relative weight, of course, grows in the EU as the UK has left, um, nothing much will, will move. Just look at the possible coalitions at the time. Uh, you know, F France, together with a number of Southern Europeans, pushed uh, for a recovery fund for euro bonds and so on and so on. But it was only the moment that Germany at least moved a little bit that this has now materialized into a Eurogroup position first and then into a European Council position. There was some discussion going on whether from an EU legal perspective it is feasible to go ahead with some of the economic recovery instruments without unanimity, for instance, without the Dutch. But it was never a question, can this actually happen without Germany on board? Um, so, so I believe firmly that the two, not only for the sake of Europe, but for their very own self-interest, have to work together. And in particular, as Thierry said, this crisis is a reminder. Europe is by far not complete, and we cannot assume it is sustainable in the way it is today. And we see very much a similarity to the crisis uh, in the Eurozone, where we realized, okay, we have built a common monetary policy, but we didn't do what we need to do to have the instruments for financial stability and for a fiscal response. And this was then added later. What we now see is we have created a Schengen area with the free movement of people and citizens, but it breaks down the moment you cannot control the danger to individual health. So if you do not set up the framework to, to provide a certain degree of protection from contagious disease on the European level, what will happen is countries will zoom in on their national territory and pull up borders because that's where the protection can be provided. And so this is another learning and it's absolutely sort of in the logic is very much the same as we saw in previous crises where we reach a point where we say either we conclude from this that we go ahead and build a more solid European system or we have more reason to assume that the European system will be deconstructed because it, at the end of the day, it doesn't deliver um, what citizens expect, expect and that makes European integration politically unsustainable. I would like to briefly comment on um, Vivian's question on, on the German reluctancy. Um, it is, a, it, you know, it's, it's very much the same arguments and patterns that are exchanged now with regards to the uh, economic and, and budgetary response um, that we have heard so many times over the past years. But I am struck by the sense, it's not the same sense of urgency that Macron conveys, but in German comparison over time, I would say the government reacts more swiftly. And again, I'm quoting our finance ministry, who is, uh, minister who, who this morning as a kind of readout to last night's summit said all the things I said, we need to provide grants, we need to raise the EU's own resources. Yes, the EU budget has to increase and Germany will contribute more. These are statements. And of course, I had discussions with, with a French friend this morning. From the French perspective on the German pos position, the glass is, is, is half empty. But looking at this over a decade, I would say there is movement and there is a realization that once again, we are moving towards a make it or break it point. And one thing that Germany doesn't want is a breakup of the single market and the currency because our whole economic growth model is built on these two pillars, plus political Thank stability, of course. Thank you, Daniela. For the few remaining minutes, um, I would suggest that we move back a little bit to the, to the health uh, related questions and systems. And there is a question here from Bernd Jales, who, uh, uh, who mentions that there's a significant distinction between the healthcare resources available in urban areas versus rural areas, which is definitely the case in the United States. And so my, his question is, what, uh, how are the healthcare systems in Europe, or let's take Germany and France, 
dealing with this disparity between countryside and city. And moreover, what likely conclusions will be drawn from this crisis as for the, de for the health systems in, in the two countries. So Thierry, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Well, first, uh, I think everybody would agree on that, I believe in France. We have excellent, excellent medicine, actually. We have very good doctors, uh, very good know-how. The problem is organization. And uh, for instance, uh, yes, of course, we have observed that the virus uh, hit much more in, the, for instance, in the Ile de France, in the Paris area, or in the, in the uh, eastern part of, of, of France, and, uh, and some of the people hit by the virus were actually cured by in Germany. Uh, and the vast majority of the rural parts of France uh, are only lightly hit by the, by the virus. Uh, which is good news. By the way, this is, you observe exactly the same in, in, in southern Italy, uh, that in southern Italy, people are not fit, but the situation is dramatic, uh, nevertheless, for economic reasons, not, not for, for health reasons. This uh, being said in passing, uh, and if you look at the world more generally, it is the case in Africa, for instance, the virus doesn't hit much, doesn't bite much in, in Africa. The problem is the economic consequences of the overall uh, a crisis. So, to come back to the question, I think that we will have, in the case of France, to, uh, as I said at the beginning of my first presentation, we will have to reorganize completely uh, the, 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 the healthcare system. Uh, and this is feasible because we have the human resources, we have the know how. Uh, and, and, and all that. So in that sense, and by the way, this was discussed even before the crisis, because there was a huge debate in France on the, on the healthcare system before at the beginning of this uh, crisis. So since we are trying at the end of this debate to, to be a little bit optimistic, uh, let us be optimistic in this dimension it's as possible. well. It's possible. Daniela, any comments on this question? Just very briefly, the debate is there in Germany as well, but the problem is less urgent uh, than, for instance, in France, because the rural urban structure is, is slightly different across uh, the country. Um, but what we see, and, 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 and Thierry mentioned that, is that, for instance, on testing, Germany is doing quite well, and part of this is a rather strong, rather decentralized capacity to actually test and get the results out quickly. So this is, this is one proof that something is working. Um, there is, of course, a discussion on the provision of, of intensive care units. Do we have enough? Are they in the right place? And what happened, for instance, in Berlin, just like in, in, uh, in other cities around the world, there was a big investment to set up new kind of temporary hospitals to provide for uh, places that, you know, for people who need intensive care, uh, because the ratio wasn't the one that in the beginning of the epidemic, uh, people thought we would need. Now we are in a more comfortable situation than we could have expected. Uh, but uh, those places are still kept in place for a possible uh, second wave of the virus. But it just shows you that um, even, you know, in a, in a city that is said to be leading on medicine and has a lot of medicine, medical tourism like Berlin has with uh, people traveling from abroad to get treated here. Uh, you know, in a pandemic situation, um, you simply need more. And this is being built on a temporary basis. Thank you. Could, could we conclude um, perhaps with one uh, remark of each of you to the following question? Where does cooperation with the United States and on the global level, World Health Organization come in at this stage? Where do you see the shortcomings? Where would you see uh, the necessities of the future? So Thierry, would you like to start? Yes, it is uh, the most uh, difficult uh, question actually, because if you look at the United States in a historical perspective, uh, the continuity of their support to Europe during 40 years, that is uh, after the 
uh, uh, from NATO to, 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 to the collapse of the Soviet Union is something which was totally unprecedented in, in, in American history, which you know much better than I do. So the question is, uh, is America back to normalcy? That is the uh, pre-Cold uh, War uh, situation. 40 years is nothing by historical uh, standards. That is the big question. And this question uh, will be as relevant if Mr. Biden is, is elected. So uh, the answer can only be at least partly Yes, cooperation is needed, if only because you cannot have interdependence without cooperation. And uh, the more the world is integrated, it will be a little less integrated, of course, in the future. There will be some deglobalization, some uh, deglobalization, but inter interdependence will continue. So uh, cooperation will be needed, if only because of that. So the real question is, can we uh, expect from the United States, uh, a, a higher degree of cooperation that is higher than the basic, uh, the, the basic necessities of a normal cooperation for an uh, international system which is highly interdependent. And frankly speaking, I do not have the question, the, uh, any idea of the answer for one single reason which is that, uh, of course, all of us, we are talking to people from the East Coast, from Harvard, from uh, uh, major universities, major think tanks. But the bulk of the American people is not there. And uh, the, 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 the Americans do not think at all in, in these terms, and which is one of the reasons for the success or relative success of uh, Mr. Trump. So uh, that big question, I think, at least tonight, remains open. Is that also the perspective in Germany, Daniela? Yes, well, I, I guess my perspective is that Trump, unfortunately, is very true to himself uh, with regards to undermining uh, global or international structures and, and being ready for international cooperation. The best example being the questioning of the value of the WHO um, and uh, the US contribution financially to this. And I guess for at least for some time until uh, maybe there's a next a different US president, um, Europeans will have to step in um, and make sure with other partners that they maintain those basic structures uh, of international cooperation. Now on my wish list, because you also asked for, for sort of the future perspective, what, where should Europe and the US cooperate? Uh, and possibly there is a chance after, after the presidential elections, uh, of course, on health issues, we saw that very clearly. Um, alone the idea of, of if there is a, a vaccination possibility, if there is a cure for this virus, one needs to have joint rules, how to organize access to this and so on. There are many things to do uh, in addition to handling the immediate crisis. Um, the macroeconomic uh, response that is needed goes beyond Europe. Um, G7 and G20 are important for for this. And the more the economic crisis deepens, and the more national protectionism rises, the more important it is to rethink. I mean, I don't think in terms of globalization and trade and so on, we will go back to uh, pre-Trump or even pre-Corona uh, times, but we need a joint approach to dealing with this new international economic order um, as well. And then final remark, where do we need cooperation with the US? Obviously in, in conflict regions and, and our weak, uh, you know, parts of our neighborhood, the Middle East, Africa, um, we can't even, you know, estimate at this point how those fragile regions will deal with uh, the developing health crisis. And I guess that will require a very, very strong international uh, investment and support to, to help them cope with the situation. Well, thank you very much. And indeed, one can conclude that the gravity of the health crisis, as well as the gravity of the task to rebuild the economy after this extraordinary event will require a return of the United States to its earlier tradition of international cooperation. And that is very much in the hands of the American voter. 
I would like to thank all of you. I apologize to those who wanted to ask a question and couldn't ask it. Thank you very much, Daniela Schwarzer in Berlin, Thierry de Montbrial in Paris. Stay safe, stay at home. All the best to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Carl.